Good evening and welcome to New Life. I'm Terry Knight, the pastor here at New Life Community Church, and I thank you so much for turning us on, tuning us in. I trust, as always, that the Lord's going to bless you up one side and down the other as we fellowship together here for the next several moments. We're going to begin a brand new teaching tonight that deals with the issue of Jesus becoming indignant. Now, what in the world would cause Jesus to become indignant? This particular message deals with the issue of confronting children with the gospel. We've titled this Children in Church versus Children and Christ. Deals with confronting children with the gospel, the fact that they need to be born again. It's an interesting topic, interesting subject, and I trust you're going to be challenged by this. All through my pastoral career, and I've been doing this for about 35 years now, believe it or not. I know I don't look it, but that's the case. But all through that time, I have had the privilege and the opportunity of spending quite a bit of time working with youth, young people, even children. And the older I get, the more difficult that is in some respects, but you learn some things. And one of the things I'm convinced of is that we need to confront our children and challenge our children from very early on with the fact that they need to be born again. They need to establish a relationship with Jesus Christ. Now, that message doesn't go over very well in some circles today, but I trust that you'll listen to this, listen to the Bible, understand Jesus' heart, and understand how important it is that we involve children in ministry and help them understand the gospel message, their need to be born again. I want to read one verse in your hearing, and we're going to jump right into this teaching. That is found in the book of Mark, chapter 10, verse 14, and the record puts it this way. When Jesus saw this, he was indignant. He said to them, let the little children come to me and do not hinder them, for the kingdom of God belongs to such as these. Pray with me. Father, I thank you so much for your word, for the instruction that it brings to us, and I pray in the name of Jesus for your anointing as we share this message, as we send it out over the airwaves tonight. Speak to us by your word, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen and amen. Will you be blessed and hang on? I'll be back here in just a little while to wrap things up. Listen to Mark 10, 14 once again. When Jesus saw this, he was indignant. That's one of the most interesting passages in all the Bible. Jesus was indignant. What in the world would make Jesus Christ indignant? And some of you may be thinking, what in the world is indignant? Well, we're going to try to find that out as we walk through this passage together and this teaching together this morning. This same passage, Mark chapter 10, the same passage can be observed in Matthew's account, chapter 19, and also Luke chapter 18. So what is going on? If I can call your attention for just a moment to Mark chapter 10 and verse number 1, we're told this. Look at this. This is just a brief introduction to kind of keep us on the same page this morning. But we're told in the latter part of verse 1, again, now again would indicate that this is not the first time this happened. Again, crowds of people came to him. I wonder why that was. And as, his, or as was his custom, he taught them. I trust you understand that Jesus the Christ is God incarnate. He's very much God. He's God in the flesh. And he came to earth and he dwelled for a while among us. And as God incarnate, Jesus the Christ, God in the flesh. Jesus traversed about the area that we know today as, where we may refer to generally as, the Middle East. And he taught the people. Watch this. Let me see your eyeballs. Jesus went around. And of all the things that he could be doing, of all the supernatural things he could be doing, he taught the people, and the people came to hear him teach. Now, I challenge you, as you're reading through the Bible devotionally from time to time, note how many times you realize that Jesus was teaching the people, or there was some teaching going on, or that the people even asked him, hey, rabbi, they called him rabbi, and that's not something they just called ever Tom, Dick, and Harry, or L. Ben, whatever his name was, or what, going down the street. 
This is something they reserved for those who were teachers, and, and they would ask him to teach them. Now watch this. This word that we call the Bible, which is so much more than a book, it's in book form, but this word, the Bible, is the record of the very teachings of Jesus Christ. The Son of God. And that's powerful. If this were just a book, it may move you. It may move some people. But this is not just a book. It's the Word of God. The teachings of Jesus the Christ. Now, there are a lot of others who claim they have books like that, but they do not. There's only one, the Bible. Watch this. If indeed the Bible is the Word of God, it is the teachings of Jesus Christ, any man would be completely foolish to ignore it. Are you with me? If the Bible is the teachings of Jesus, if it is the Word of God, then any man would be completely foolish to ignore it. There are some things that you may ignore in this life, and it won't be that big a deal. But to ignore the Word of God is foolish. Now, there is a growing number of persons today who have, for whatever reason, they've decided to believe that the Bible is something other than the Word of God, citing a multitude of philosophical reasons and excuses for their conclusions. And ironically, most of their, their reasons, most of those excuses can be summarized by the very Bible that they shun. God's appointed vessel, the Apostle Paul, wrote to encourage a young believer, a young man named Timothy. This letter was written to encourage Timothy. Timothy was a preacher. And Paul wrote to encourage him to preach. Now watch this. You can preach about a lot of different things. Most of us, when we think about a preacher, we think about those preaching the Word of God. That isn't necessarily the case nowadays, but that was the case with Paul. That was the case with Timothy. And Paul was encouraging Timothy to be faithful to the Word of God. Why? Look at this verse. It's in the, the second letter of Timothy, chapter 4, verse 3. Paul said to young Timothy that he was discipling, that he was mentoring. He says, the time will come when men will not put up with sound doctrine. Everybody say sound doctrine. You know what sound doctrine is? It's biblically correct teaching. That's all that is. Not very kind. You don't have to go to seminary to learn that and take a course on it. Sound doctrine. A time will come when men will not put up with sound doctrine. What does that mean? They won't put up with it. They won't read it. If they do read it, they're going to read it and try to find loopholes in it and try to find contradictions in it and try to undo it as it is the Word of God. There's a time coming when men not, will not put up with sound doctrine. Why? Why would they do that? He tells you. Instead, to suit their own desires. Hmm? Don't we live in that kind of world? To suit their own desires, they will gather around them a great number of teachers to say what their itching ears want to hear. My ears itching. Would you scratch it with something I like? Look at the next verse. They will turn their ears away from the truth and turn aside to myths. That's a dangerous thing. Oh, what a horrible picture of someone who has the precious Word of God. And it says there's coming a time when people will take this and they will turn from this and turn to myths. That would be things that men come up with out of their own head. Well then, on this particular occasion, back in Mark chapter 10, we find Jesus with his disciples. Who is he with? He's with his disciples. And the Bible, the record is very clear that people were bringing little children to Jesus. What a beautiful scene. I love that. Just close your eyes for a moment and picture, if you will, Jesus standing there or sitting there or ever what he was doing there. And people are bringing these little children. Kind of looked like when KFC, when the KFCers broke loose from the freedom 
uh, or the uh, restraints of mom and dad this morning. And they come up. Can you just picture a scene like that? That's what's going on. Now, I want you to note the details surrounding these children. The original language makes clear that which is translated in the New International Version and a lot of other versions. It translates little children. The original word, and I'm headed to number one on your study notes, the original word, the, uh, the Greek word, indicates that it is a child under training. Everybody say training. You understand children and training? You understand? This was children under training. It implies, the original word implies a younger child, perhaps seven years old or younger. Wow, what a beautiful scene. Look at verse 13. People were bringing little children to Jesus to have him touch them. They were bringing the little children so that Jesus might touch their little children. And again, and I, this is not a Greek lesson this morning. I'm not a Greek scholar, neither the son of a, a Greek scholar. I can read, write, and do a little bit of arithmetic. This word for touch means just a little bit more than physically placing one body part against another. But it carries with it the connotation of expecting to receive something as a result of. You understand? You see, I can just... I can touch this platinum pulpit up here, but that's just touching. But they were bringing these little children to Jesus, expecting that as they touched him, they were going to receive something. It's incredible. And then look at the latter part of verse 13. Man, this is so exciting. This has caused revival in so many churches. Look at this. But the disciples rebuked them. Huh? People were bringing little children to Jesus to have him touch them, expecting to receive something. And the disciples rebuked them. The New Living Translation puts it this way. The disciples scolded the parents for bothering him. Oh my goodness, they just messed up that beautiful little picture I had going on in my head. That little movie that was going on there. Now, I can only speculate as to why these disciples were attempting to shoo the children away and protect Jesus from them. But you know, little children do have a way of upstaging adults, don't they? Let me show you. You guys know... Know who Peyton Manning is? He comes from a great long line of Mannings, Archie's boy. And he uh, is a quarterback, number 18 for the Denver Broncos. And he's knocking down about 15, 150 in salary. It'd be 15 million, 150,000. How many of you could handle that for a year or three? Oh, yeah. Wouldn't you love that? I'd work two years and quit. That's what I'm talking about. So... In many people's mind, this is a pretty important fella. But I want you to listen to this interview of Peyton, who, much to his credit, brought his little boy along for this particular interview. Watch this with me. Uh, once again, hard to put it into words. It, it, was, it was special. It was unique. Uh, it was a, a feel thing where we just saw things the same way, kind of a, a head nod there. <laughs> A head nod there, a wink there, where we just kind of knew where each uh, where each guy was going to be, and uh, and like his recall is what made him so special too. He had the unbelievable ability to. Uh, you want that mic? Can he bite the mic? Sure, Everybody absolutely. Uh, he had that ability to, to bring up uh, uh, you know plays from ten you know eight years ago, and that's not normal. That is not normal to be able to do that. So. Uh, that, that's kind of what made him special, what separated him. I think he and, wants uh, to take over the interview. He does, he does. Do you have so, anything to say? Uh, <laughs> nice smile, absolutely. He got baptized this morning, he and his sister, so it was a big big day today. So, awesome. So, anyway, yeah, it, it was great seeing Marvin. It was, it was a special, 
Uh, I thought the, the, the tribute was first class. And... How many people were in that video? Oh, just one, the little baby. How many of you saw Peyton? What was the focal point of that video? Little boy. You see, children have a way of upstaging adults. Now, listen, I don't know if that's what was going on in Mark chapter 10. That could have been what was going on. Maybe that's why the disciples wanted to shoo those children away. I trust their motives were pure. I trust that's the case. Number two on your study notes, perhaps the disciples were under the impression that Jesus had more important things to do than entertain very small children. Let me do that again. Perhaps they thought Jesus had better things to do than entertain little small children. You know, there are a whole lot of dads that feel that there are more important things than that. Am I right? God help us. Let's leave that biting point. Let me cut to the chase and move on to the second verse of our text paragraph. Look at Mark 10, 14 again. It tells us when Jesus saw this, the parents being scolded, the children being hindered. When Jesus saw this, he was indignant. In case you don't know what indignant is, some of you have probably been indignant and you didn't even know it. Some versions translate it this way, Jesus was much displeased. That sounds a whole lot more better than indignant, doesn't it? One says he became irritated. One commentator goes so far, or one translation goes so far as to say he became furious. They're getting close. Contemporarily, we might say, although you've got to be careful how you say this about Jesus, but contemporarily, we might say he was ticked off. He was upset. Jesus is upset in our text. Jesus isn't supposed to get upset. What's the matter with him? He's Jesus. But he's upset. Why? We're told why. In his own words, Jesus said, little children were being hindered from coming to him. Now watch this. Of all the things, that good evangelicals become upset about today. Boy, don't we get upset. I stay upset about half the time. Can't believe this is going on. Can't believe that's going on. I got a letter from one of the watchdog groups that I just opened up this morning about a certain agenda of some folks in our country. And it just, whoo! But I just wonder how often we're upset because of the same things that upset Jesus. He was upset because the children were hindered. Watch this, the word hindered in the original is a strong word. It means quite a bit more than giving someone a choice. It, it was not as though the disciples were saying to these children, well, you can see Jesus or not see Jesus. The choice is yours. That's not what's meant by hindered. Hindered means that, that rather they were putting forth effort to stop them. No way, uh-uh, y'all get out of here. Now, you might think, well, we would never do that. It's terrible. What in the world were the twelve not thinking? Watch this. Beloved, the hindering of children happens. All the time today. It happens all the time. Often by default, the parent didn't mean for it to work out that way, but the damage is done. You see, what's this. If the parent of a child fails to, look at your neighbor and say fails to. If the parent of a child fails to bring God to the attention of their child, then have they not effectively hindered that child from coming to God? I know you haven't had as much time to think about that as I have, but I suggest to you it's true. Even if a parent knows about God, they know about God, 
and they fail to express what they know to their child, then in effect, they have hindered their child from knowing about God. Should we be concerned that our children know about God? After all, they're just children. They're just youngins. Hey, this, this is hot off the press. You know what a youngin is? He's a little, he or she is a little person. A little person. In fact, Pastor Harley calls our KFCers a lot of times, he refers to them as our little people. That's what they are, they're little people. They've got hands and arms and feet and mouth and nose and internal organs and a brain and everything. They're just little people. They're people, they're just little. Little people. Should we be concerned that our little people know about God? Well, I just happen to believe that we should be concerned about that. Let me change gears just a little bit. Beloved, if, if, write if on your study note somewhere in big, bold, capital letters. The biggest little word in the English language. It's a conditional statement. If, or a conditional word rather. If little children can be hindered from coming to the Lord, then it must be that these little children can also come to the Lord. If they can be hindered, then they can come. Does that make sense? If they can be hindered, then they can be encouraged. They can be allowed, if you please. Look at Mark 10, verse 14. Kind of the middle to the latter part of the verse. And I want you to read this right out loud with me here this morning. Look at this. He, Jesus, read it out loud with me. He said to them, let the little children come to me and do not hinder them for the kingdom of God belongs to such as these. Belongs to such as who? These little people? Wow. I've been asked over and over again over the past 30 plus years, Pasta T, what is the optimum age for a child to come to Christ or for one to come to Christ? What is the optimum age? You might want to put that in the blank on your study notes. What is the optimum age? What do you think? What is the perfect age for one to come to Christ? I've heard a lot of arguments over the years. Trust me. I've heard a lot of arguments. I've heard a lot of arguments for the 18 to 21 range. Yes, we don't, we're not going to pressure our children. We're just going to wait until they get 21. And yeah, I've heard a lot of arguments for that. Could it be that Jesus answers this very question right here in verse 15 about the optimum age? Jesus says, Truly, I tell you, I think one version says, I tell you the truth. What does Jesus tell? The truth. Here's the truth on this thing. Jesus says, truly, I tell you, anyone who will not receive the kingdom of God like a little child will never enter it. Are you going to heaven someday? Are you going to enter the kingdom of God someday? If you do, you will have to do that like a little child. That's what Jesus said. Now, this tells me, among a number of other things, and we can make a lot of applications here, but it tells me that it is possible to come into relationship with God even as a child. And I would argue to you this morning that that is not only possible, but it is a preference. It's preferred. Not just possible, but preferred. In fact, unless one comes with childlike faith, Jesus says you can't come at all. wonder if this is partly the reason why it is so difficult for maturing, aging adults. You, you know what a maturing, aging adult is? Out in the street they would refer to them as old people. I would never say that because I'm kind of finding myself in that category these days. But I wonder if one of the reasons why it's so difficult for maturing, aging adults to establish a relationship with 
Christ is because you have to come with childlike faith. And isn't it true? The older we get, the more independent we get. Isn't that true? You know, I'm a very patient person. Beloved, we're going to cut in right there. Lord willing, we'll wrap up the back half of this particular teaching, this particular part of this teaching on next week's edition. Let me ask you this before we go off the air tonight. Perhaps you are a young person. I know that there are some younger people that listen to New Life Telecast. I encounter you from time to time. Uh, ever who you are, young, old, or in between, in particular if you're a younger person, have you made Jesus the Lord of your life? Have you accepted Christ as your Lord and Savior? Have you been born again, born anew of the Spirit of God? That is God's will, God's purpose and plan for your life. Hey, maybe you have young children and you're listening to the program tonight and perhaps many think, well, you know, we're just going to let these kids make their own decision or wait until later on or this is not something that they can comprehend at a young age. Oh, yes, they can. They're just little people, as we indicated earlier, and they need the input, need the gospel uh, input early on, not later, but earlier as the Lord leads. I want to be an encouragement to you if you have young children to present the gospel to them. Keep them under the influence of the gospel that they might uh, make or uh, establish a relationship with the Lord early on in their life as opposed to waiting later on and drifting or worse yet, never coming to know Christ. Statistically, those who establish a relationship with Christ do so before the age of 18, uh, before the age of 25 even. After that, statistically, the odds of one becoming a follower of Christ are very, very minuscule. So it's important to get this message, this gospel message to the children earlier as opposed to later. I want to remind you of a couple of things that take place here at New Life before I go off the air tonight, not the least of which is our Sunday morning worship celebration. Each and every Sunday morning at 10 o'clock, we meet for fellowship and worship and a time in the Word, the teachings that you hear on New Life Telecast. That's what we do on Sunday morning. We also have midweek activities. Wednesday evening, we call it Family Ministries Night. Each and every Sunday, or Sunday, each and every Wednesday night at 7 o'clock. Midweek Family Ministries Night. We would love to have you if you aren't connected elsewhere. Let me uh, also begin to give you uh, a little heads up that for many, many years, well nearly, oh my goodness, uh, probably 27 years, I have been utilizing the theme song that you hear on New Life Telecast. I've been utilizing that on radio and now the television for uh, a number of years. And we're in the process of redoing our intro. You're going to see and hear something a little different as we try to uh, reshape this telecast to accommodate some other areas of ministry that are available to us today through video. And I'm not talking about doing away with this program uh, by any means, but adding some things to to this in terms of some video uh, and the, uh, the potential that's available to us. So in the next few weeks, you may be uh, turning on New Life Telecast at whatever time you see that, typically 8 o'clock on Sunday evening, and you may not hear that age-old, long-time theme. You may hear a different theme and see a kind of a different skin around this telecast. So don't be alarmed. I'll warn you couple of weeks before we make that happen. I am Terry Knight, the pastor of New Life Community Church. I trust you're going to have a great week. And remember, my friends, if you don't live it, you don't have it.